um, this is a follow-up session. This is the Q&A follow-up to the Roadmap to Comprehensive Prevention Planning webinar that took place on March 30th. Since this is the second of three sessions surrounding this topic, it's important to note that in the next session, which will be discussed at the end as a next step, there will be a TA clinic that will happen in a few weeks. So just stay tuned until the end to make sure that you hear about that as well. So before we talk about the questions, I wanted to give you a quick reminder of what was discussed on March 30th. Now the questions that, are, that were brought today into the session were submitted either during the registration process for today. Some of them were um, asked during or after the March 30th webinar. And as pre-work for today's session, you should have already attended that initial meeting on March 30th, or you would have watched the replay. If you currently are watching this webinar as a replay and you have not seen the first session that happened on March 30th, please stop this recording and start with the first webinar. So as a refresher for, for what we covered in the March 30th webinar, that would be the Roadmap to Comprehensive Prevention Planning, there were a few important topics, bullet points, objectives that were addressed. So I wanna remind you of what those were. We discussed Family First Prevention Services Program and the Comprehensive Prevention Plan, including the opt-in process. We outlined the elements of the Comprehensive Prevention Plan and who needs to be involved in the process for their county. We reviewed the TA roadmap, how it works, the difference between the capacity assessment and the readiness assessment. We discussed the funding process, including what funds can be spent at various time points in the process and on what activities. And lastly, we outlined how to access additional support and information on the comprehensive prevention plan process, including how to be involved in its development. So as we, well, let me actually remind you of one more thing. When I talk about this roadmap, you would have seen this, but this is a reminder. I believe I also have a very quick um, link for you so that you can have a copy of this. Here you are, I'm gonna drop this right into the chat. So you can have a copy of what we're looking at on the screen. This will also help as we're answering questions, we try to answer them in a sequential order where possible. All right. Let me continue. Now, if you missed it, or if you wanna see any of the other trainings that are surrounding this reimagining prevention topic, they can be found in a couple different places. One of those are on the caltrin.org website. You'll see that there's a reimagining prevention webinar series in the header. And very much like the last webinar, we will have all of the training materials, webinars, the learning objectives, really anything that you would need to know for anything that you have missed. So again, highly encourage you to go back um, and take a look. Now today's Q&A panel is comprised of key partners in this reimagining prevention process. Different ones will speak depending on the question that is posed, but I wanted to give you kind of an idea of the representation in the room today. We have CDSS with us, we have DHCS with us, Strategies TA, and of course Caltrain, hi. Um, and between these different agencies and these different services um, that we're all working together for reimagining prevention, you'll see that different panelists may respond, but they'll introduce themselves so that we know who, who is who. All right, so now let me give you an idea of what this Q&A is gonna look like, feel like for the next um, hour or so. Uh, the questions that were submitted during and after the Roadmap to Comprehensive Prevention Planning webinar were sorted into four main categories. And those four main categories in order will be funding, program design, policy, tools, and resources. These were the most commonly asked questions, if you will. So we're going to address each category one at a time. I will be moderating this conversation by posing the most frequently asked questions about the topic to the panel. When, uh, and they'll respond, of course. Then we'll move into an open Q&A session where, where we will be taking questions from the audience. So you, whether you put them in the chat, which I see some are coming through, uh, you'll also have an opportunity to raise your hand and ask that question live. So if you're thinking of questions as we go, if they're not answered yet, um, I would jot those down either in the chat 
or probably I'd recommend it. Just raise your hand and ask at the end and I, I'll, I will call on you, I promise. Uh, if you have any questions that are specific to your agency or they're specific to your county, you're encouraged to submit those questions here. And if it's just very, very specific to you and your situation, there will be a place where you can ask that. And I'll make sure to, to address that as we move along. So for now, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we are going to jump into the Q&A session. So I do have some questions that were um, the frequently asked questions. Let me begin with the first. It's a funding question, which you may be here for. The first question is, can FFPSA funding be used for primary prevention? So I'm gonna pose that to the panel. Can anyone address that? Can FFPSA funding be used for primary prevention? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Hillary Conrad with the Department of Social Services, the Chief of the Office of Child Abuse Prevention. And Jessica, I can answer that question. Um, FFPSA funding is meant for delivering evidence-based services to candidates that would be um, in the child welfare system or that are participating in the community pathway. So it cannot be used for primary prevention. Okay, thank you. Um, now, I'm curious um, if there are, you know, any options for funding or, or some suggestions, I think, um, people may want to know what, what options are available. And I can answer that as well, Jess. Um, there are definitely other funding sources. So there's one funding source, the Family First Transition Act funding that can be used, uh, not only for primary, but secondary and tertiary prevention as well. There's also the state block grant funding, which is the funding that allows counties to go beyond FFPSA services and develop their comprehensive plan. Um, and that can be used for primary as well. There's also recently been um, the ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act CBCAP funding that is specifically for primary and secondary prevention. And um, there's also the fact that you can leverage other local funding sources or sources from other service sectors when you're developing your comprehensive plan. So you're not limited to just using FFPSA dollars. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is still in funding. Um, where is the list or is there a list of allocations for the 25 million CBCAP ARPA money? There is. It's posted on the CDSS website, and I also, Jess is going to drop it in the chat, and it basically explains what the allocation is that went to county child welfare agencies that chose to opt into that primary secondary prevention funding source, and 54 counties, as well as two uh, Title IV-E agreement tribes opted in. Thank you very much. Jessica, this is Kelly Winston. Um, I wanted to add a little bit of information to what Hillary had provided around FFPSA funding. So when we say FFPSA, that, um, that terminology actually refers to the federal statute, but the money that we're really talking about is Title IV-E funding for prevention services. So when we think about whether FFPSA funding can be used for primary prevention, we're really talking about Title IV-E and that really is in that um, set of programs that are evidence-based, that are included in the federal clearinghouse and that are in the state's primary or, uh, prevention plan um, that are um, uh, eligible for e expenditures. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to remind folks of is that that is an ongoing source of funding, whereas the state block grant funds is really a three-year allocation to help um, support implementation of the primary and secondary funding strategies. Um, and then I think Hillary mentioned briefly the Family First Transition Act funds, and that's a federal grant um, that that grant is um, authorized for five years to help counties transition from the Title IV E waiver demonstration project. So many counties participated in that and they can use that five-year grant to help transition from those programs into prevention. And many counties opted into that. Again, that's a five-year federal grant. Um, so just a little bit of additional information there. Thank you, thank you for that. Okay, 
Uh, then, and one quick note I want to make um, that I've seen in the chat, and thank you, uh, Dana, that the links that are dropped into the chat are captured and will be sent in the follow-up email. So there is a lot of information, which is great, and that information will be captured in the follow-up email. So if you miss it, don't you worry. Okay, so this question uh, we saw posed in, in a couple different ways, but what does payer of last resort mean? What does payer of last resort mean? Hi, uh, this is Cheryl Treadwell with the uh, Safety and Early Prevention Branch and Branch Chief. Um, so the payer of last resort is a terminology that's often used in the Medi-Cal world and other worlds when we're talking about funding. It simply means that who pays first? If the service is an eligible Medi-Cal activity, the provider is Medi-Cal certified and we have an eligible beneficiary, then the FFPSA activity or the evidence-based practice that falls into the mental health category, substance abuse or the parenting skills, then Medi-Cal will be the first payer as well as any public or private sources and then Title IV-E pays if those sources are not available to pay or they don't meet the eligibility criteria. So that is that is basically simply the last payer, first payer, meaning Medi-Cal, meeting those require eligibility requirements. If it's an activity eligible beneficiary and certified provider, they will pay first. Um, and, and why this is different and why this comes up for uh, FFPSA and for our implementation for prevention services is typically because this leads to what uh, Kelly said earlier. Typically, we have not had the availability of 4E to pay for services. So now that they're entering the space of paying for service delivery, uh, when in the past, they usually use 4E to pay for placements. Now we're using 4E to pay for services. So that's why the pair of last resort becomes a conversation uh, at this point. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, all right. Next funding question. Uh, what do you what do you mean by admin activities? Is that time study hours? I can actually take that one. Uh, my name is Kelly Kaczynski and I'm the manager in the children's unit in fiscal policy and analysis. Um, so Time study hours, those are just one piece of the puzzle with claiming. Um, there will also be other PIN codes available. Um, there's gonna be a lot of claiming information that'll be laid out very specifically with a great amount of detail in a forthcoming claiming CFL county fiscal letter. And we expect that to be out in mid-May and it's currently undergoing approvals. But I can speak a little bit about the admin activities um, that we were just talking about. So admin claiming will be split into two main buckets. Of funding. So there's federal Title IV-E and then state block grant through the FFPS. And in general, administrative claiming encompasses the time that's spent by the child welfare staff to administer the program and training about the programs, um, like receiving the, the training about the program. And so when you see the claiming CFL, it'll lay out all of this information again in really great detail. Um, so the, the 4E admin and training you can think of as things like capacity and readiness assessments to establish and implement the Title IV East Prevention Services, asset mapping, needs assessments for establishing and implementing 4 e prevention services, coordinating with local behavioral health and mental health plan establishment of uh, implementation of 4 e prevention services and developing model fidelity and oversight protocols. Um, the state block grant admin and training activities, those, those are the ones that are not gonna be 4E eligible. And they're kind of more directed to be in support of developing your comprehensive prevention plan, the CPP. And again, these will all be broken out in very specific lists that are bulleted and it'll be very obvious which one is which. But again, so the state block grant one, you can think of it as developing and revising the local comprehensive prevention plan, the CPP, capacity and readiness necessities for the non-Title IV-E services under the CPP asset mapping and needs assessment of selection of the non-4E prevention services, um, developing the spending planning and training and workforce. Again, it's very technical um, and it's not gonna be covered too much in depth here because it's still undergoing, um, it's in the approval process uh, and it can still change. And so I don't wanna give you guys information that's outdated by the time the CFL comes out, 
but that's kind of a brief overview on that one. So admin activities is not just um, time study hours. It could be other activities as well that get picked up by those pins. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. All right, um, the next question is, will a CFL be released regarding specifics to claiming funds? Um, when will child specific for e-claiming be available? The, I think those are kind of maybe together. It is, yeah. So I'll, I'll take that one again, it's Kelly again. So um, we do have a drafted CFL that's currently being vetted by outside stakeholders at CWDA, and it's going uh, undergoing internal review as well. And in it, we're gonna lay out the different admin and training and prevention services codes that'll be used to draw down both the federal 4E and the state block grant for FFPS. And we, again, anticipate this letter being released in about May, early May and mid-May. Meanwhile, we ask that you do track the time that you spend on activities related to this ACL and what we're discussing today. So tracking the actual time that you're spending on these activities so that you can claim once the CFL is released. Um, and then you asked about um, child specific 4E claiming to be available. Child Yes, so child-specific 4E is really linked closely with CARES. So CWS CARES is going to be scheduled to roll out to users by 2023 to 2024. However, CWS CARES is currently analyzing the cost and timeline for potential earlier release. So we'll see how that plays out. But again, 2023 to 2024. And until CWS CARES rolls out, then child-specific claiming for the prevention services themselves will not be federally eligible. So that is, you cannot draw down 4E until we have this child-specific tracking and automation. However, those prevention services will get picked up by the code for the FFPS, the state block grant preventative services. So um, they, uh, they, they're just not quite yet, but we do have a mechanism in place that will be addressed in the forthcoming CFL. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm not sure maybe this one too, you might've already touched on it briefly. Um, can you share about funding specifically the 4E drawdown process? Yes, so that's, that's all related um, with CARES and um, maybe I can give a little bit more information about that. So. Part of the federal requirements of FFPSA Part 1 um, outline ensuring like adherence to model fidelity and oversight and quality control and standardization for data collection, that sort of information, outcome tracking federal reporting. And therefore, the data has to be collected in a standardized and statewide automation solution, which is CARES. Um, and so uh, 2023, 2024. 2023. Is we're yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so here is uh, something that's kind of fun. The questions I've posed. Jess, can I jump in oh, for a second? Please. Um, I would say that it, it's for direct service costs and services planning for families to try to simplify it a little bit. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. So this, typically, we are going to open up Q&A at the end of this session, but there were so many questions um, that were great questions. We wanted, and I see some in the chat, we wanna pause for a moment and allow an open forum, and then we can continue and we'll do it again in a little bit. Uh, and so I wanted to address some of the questions that are in the chat, but of course, if you have a question out there in the audience, please raise your hand. Raise your hand and we'd love to call on you, even if your question is in the chat and you'd like to ask it out loud, please do so. And you can raise your hand two ways. There should be a reaction along the your toolbar, or you might be able to select that option as a part, next to your name in the participant list. Um, but I'll address one of the first questions. And panelists, if you see a question that has been asked uh, that you really want to jump into, please let me know. But let me take a little look here. I, I saw one that I don't want to miss. Um, and if it's going to come up in a little bit later, let us know. We'll just pause and we can talk about this in a few. But what are counties planning in terms of ensuring sustainability of CPP services after the initial funding? Linda, thank you for that question. Any thoughts about that? 
I can jump in on that one and Cheryl or Hillary, if you have things to add, I think that would be good. Um, I think we're very early in the process and we haven't had a lot of conversations with counties about what they're planning yet. Um, in fact, we're just getting their letters of intent to identify that they plan to submit a comprehensive plan. Um, so I would say um, that um, there's a question in the CPP requirements where we want to encourage folks to let us know, you know, what their plans are for that. And then also, what are any challenges or barriers to that? You know, where can we, we provide some assistance on thinking through that problem with them? Um, so, and then I would also invite for those of you who are a part of a county planning team, if you've already had some conversations about that locally, about how you might use other funding sources um, to help provide that sustainability, um, please throw them in the chat. I mean, certainly the more information we can share amongst each other, the better. Thank you. Um, I saw a couple questions about the block grant. So we'll start with Rob's question. Are, are there any exclusions as we explore primary prevention services to fund with SBG funds? I think I can take that. This is Hillary. Somebody jump in if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but the block grant is more flexible funding. Um, so you can use it for primary and secondary prevention. Um, Great. Yeah. Was there anything else to add, any panelists? If not, I will move on to the next question. I'm actually going to ask another uh, block state block grant question. It's from Emma. It's my understanding that the state block grant funds can be used for services that are not yet in the evidence-based clearinghouse or that are, but are not well supported. Can you elaborate on this? Do children served by this funding need to have a prevention plan? Okay, so I'll jump in as well for this one. Um, Emma is correct. Yes, you can use the block grant letter for, or the block grant funds outside of the well-supported EBPs, but it can also be used for other EBPs that are on the Title IV E Prevention Clearinghouse. Um, and then her next question was, can you tell Absolutely. me the next? Yeah. The next question was, um, can you elaborate, uh, do children served by this funding need to have a prevention plan? I can take that one, Hillary. Um, okay. So, it's the Title IV-E eligible services that require a prevention plan. Um, so we hadn't really anticipated what that would look like for services beyond that, but any anything in the program, we would want there to be some sort of plan, right? Whether it's um, included in a 4 eligible service or not. An exception to that might be like a primary prevention service where you're not really entering in a case plan with a family, that kind of thing. Um, but definitely for 4 eligible services, a prevention plan is required. Thank you. And then I think this is the last block uh, that includes the block grant. Can SBG and FFTA be used to contract an outside TA consultant to help with the development and implementation of a CCP. I guess that's CPP. I'll take that one again as well. Um, so we actually asked this question on the letter of intent. Um, we wanted to know if you're gonna be hiring a consultant to help you develop your plan. Um, we wanna support that across the state. So any area where technical assistance is provided by an additional entity, we wanna work closely with them to make sure that we're all um, able to weave our technical assistance together and working in the same direction. We want it to be a coordinated approach. Um, so in fact, if you have hired one and um, you have not let us know, um, please feel free to reach out to the prevention, uh, the FFPSA prevention services mailbox. Great, thank you. And I'll be speaking about that mailbox. We, we will talk about the mailbox quite a bit throughout because the, this Q&A is not the only place you can ask these great questions. There is a place that's been designated for them. And so I wanna make sure we, we will touch on it more than once. Um, and then I have two last questions here. Um, well, we're going to make it three. I'm going to continue. It's either Martin or Martin. There's one more question about the SBG. Does a service funded by the SBG need to be evidence-based? What if it's culturally relevant, but not yet rated by either the state or federal clearinghouse? 
So I can take that one again. So the state block grant really is there for you to be able to use services that are not included in the state's prevention plan. Um, there may be a reason that we want to fund it with uh, state block grant dollars so that we can then evaluate it for inclusion in the plan, but that's still not a requirement. It's really intended to get at those services that are not included in the plan. Thank you. All right, and then I think these are the last two Then we're gonna to move to the next um, topic. What if the provider is not Medi-Cal? Uh, what if it's not a Medi-Cal provider? Do they have to become one or can FFPSA be used? I can answer that. Um, so based on our communication with our federal partners recently, we were told that you do not have to become Medi-Cal certified in order to deliver 4E services. So if you're not able to bill Medi-Cal, then you wouldn't do it. Great. And then this last question in regards to the opt-in, and you can tell me if we should wait until uh, we get to the program design. In regards to opt-in, counties contributing to the state MOE what will be the contribution per county and is that coming from realignment? That's a question, this is Cheryl. That's probably a question that we, um, we haven't worked out the details uh, on MOE. Uh, so that, it, that will be a, a developmental question that we're still working on, most likely in consultation with counties. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a question about the letter of intent, which I believe we're going to be speaking about in just a few moments. So I'm going to hold that question, Yadira. We will get to it. Thank you for submitting. Great. Okay. So moving into the next um, section, we're going to be talking about program design, which there were uh, some great questions in there as well. And here's the first. How do we access what those 10 EBPs are? Can you provide a link to the title for your 4E Clearinghouse? And Jess, I can answer that. Um, so yes, there is a link uh, that you can not only see the 10 EVPs that are in our California state plan, but as well as the other well-supported, promising, and supported EVPs. You can also review a current draft of our FFPSA California state plan to see what are the 10 well-supported EVPs that we have chosen. Thank you. And I believe um, Jennifer has uh, has. The link. Dropped a link for us there. Um, all right. And are there examples from California counties who are farther, uh, maybe farther in the prevention planning process? So lessons learned, program strategies selected. Yeah, I can share a little bit. I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but uh, for the past, I guess, two, three years, we've been working on cross-sector prevention planning across the state. Uh, there are officially 24 counties that are participating in this process. So they have been conducting pre-work such as asset mapping, needs assessment, um, engaging with their community to develop a voluntary plan. Um, so now we're, we're suggesting and encouraging that those prevention planning teams leverage some of the work that they've already conducted in order to develop their comprehensive prevention plan. And the folks that we've been partnering with, Strategies TA, who are also on this call today, um, have been doing the groundwork with these uh, prevention planning teams. And I think that they would have some great suggestions or have some, this would be a great time for them to weigh in on their experiences thus far. Great. Sure, I'm happy to hop in. Um, I'm Lola Cornish and I'm the Chief uh, Senior Program Manager for Strategies Technical Assistance at the Child Abuse Prevention Center here in Sacramento. And I have a couple of examples for you of lesson learned and of challenges. So um, in Sacramento County, um, the prevention group determined that they could not move the process forward without meaningful engagement with the community. And so they um, set up a, a, a community engagement committee and they recently at their last meeting had their first two community members participate after I, they um, figured out all the outline for that. So that's one piece. Um, in Stanislaw, our consultants reported that three things were emerging as the team builds our understanding of what it takes to design a plan like this. 
So number one, process is not linear at all. Um, number two, members need to be educated about the process and the broader content related to family and child well-being. And three, that this work takes more time and effort than they've ever been asked to do before in, in a CAPSI or in a prevention group. Um, in Napa County, they realized that their previous plan that they had was kind of more like a set of tasks. And so um, they, they broadened uh, by using a driver diagram to really look at sustainable change and they're following that process. And in Nevada County, they uh, blended funding to get a paid staff person as a coordinator for the CAPSI and the prevention plan. Um, and I'm sure Sarah and Lydia have some more examples. Um, just let me list a couple of challenges that came from our key informant interviews um, that we did at the end of last fiscal year. Number one, it takes a lot of time to build a true collaborative, to develop those trusting relationships, um, that it takes time. That there's, there's limited or, or no funding for staffing for a a, a person to really keep this work moving forward, organizing it, sending out all the emails, things of that nature, or a backbone organization, and that they've struggled with community engagement, particularly for those with lived experience. Sarah or Lydia, do you want to hop in? Sure. Uh, sorry, my internet is not working very well, so I'm not going to be off camera, but you know, one of the things I think that really challenged a lot of the teams that we've been working with was the pandemic. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge that we had so many teams that had to kind of start once they realized the pandemic was going to last past three months. And so I just, I'm, I, I just wanted to um, mention that a lot of these teams got back together and started working full steam ahead, which is just really speaks to the commitment of um, you know child and family wellness that a lot of our counties in this great state have and I think some of the lessons learned was that it's really important to look at this work through a lens of equity um, in order to engage your community and I think another important piece of this work is um, just a reminder to engage tribes and the tribal community um, and you know it, it takes time it's building a relationship I think that patience is something that can be really hard <laughs> to have sometimes because we want to see the results. But when it comes to the community and relationships, I think patience and building that trust and being transparent in that process is something that is imperative. Um, and thankfully, we've seen the fruits of the labor of doing that. So definitely, um, hopefully, we can support more teams in this process because I think that there's a lot of uh, great work to be done. Great, thank I'll, you all. I'll lastly just share, I mean, you all provided some wonderful examples and many of those I had as well, but uh, building the relationships, I think one of the lessons learned is for many of our teams is that engaging the community was an afterthought or it came after the fact, right? And we have this great opportunity right now to say, wait, there is actually funding available now, right? We actually could have people pay to support this process and help us to coordinate. Um, and we can learn from these amazing voluntary teams that have been doing this because they see the value and commitment in it. And how do we start first with looking at who are our partners that can help us to engage the community, right? Title IV agencies don't have to do this alone. They're not expected to be the ones, only ones doing this, right? You have a partner, a group of partners, you have a collaborative for a reason. And so looking at the strengths and assets even within your collaborative to say who can really be the ones that have those trusting relationships and how do we wanna structure bringing community into this process and building their capacity to be an equal member of this team. So I just will share that that's one thing I see time and time again is there's a true desire to do it. It does take time, but when you start with that mindset and that value from the beginning, um, it's gonna take you much farther than you I think ever could imagine. Thank you so much.
Um, I really appreciate your uh, experience and what you've shared. And I feel like in the chat, um, have you, I haven't seen any questions come through, which means we're probably answering a lot of them. Um, okay, next question is, oh, sorry, one thing I did want to mention about the chat, uh, someone asked, is there a list of the 24 counties? And thank you, Hillary, for saying we can email the list out after the call. So I wanted to address that. All right, so this is still about the program design. Will guidance and methodologies be made available for how to project target population numbers? I actually saw that question in a couple different ways from the previous webinar. They were asking about specific populations, um, but I think we'll start by talking about how to project target population numbers. Hi, this is Cheryl Chadwell. Um, I'll take that question. So this is an area where we think that we should provide TA uh, to the counties to help them explore uh, those type of approaches and methodologies. Um, you know, essentially, there's a need to look at your target populations by using the right data, uh, drilling down with the right data. You know, we made a very broad candidacy pool and groupings. And so how do you take what the state has developed broadly and translate that to your local levels? Um, we are developing some tools, um, some cross-sector tools. We're developing the data playbook. Um, but ultimately, we think that in order for us to, in order for you to do that work, that we need to work with you uh, on a county-specific basis and help you sort of walk through what are, the, what are the key target populations in your community you need to look at. I mean, I see where you, you, they're talking about immigrant and refi refugee servicing organizations or community. I mean, if that's the area, the, those are areas that you think you need to target your, your uh, resources for with respect to prevention, then that is what you prioritize. But data will tell you those questions and that data will answer those questions for you. So it is our intent to, to you know, deploy some resources to help you work through uh, some of those data points and methodologies. And, and then, you know, as well as you seeking out the, the availability of consultants that could help you work through that as well. And of course, all of this to do with equity lens too, as well as what we want you to target. So bottom line is that I just think that it is an area that we will help you explore counties and that um, you know, using existing resources, data that we currently pull through our Child Welfare Indicators Project with Berkeley. There's a lot of places where you can use data to sort of drill down how to target uh, the communities uh, that you want to serve. And so, and then also thinking about also how to make the fit for where the EVPs uh, fit for your target populations and where there might be other services that are not EVPs. And that is that sort of sources to the conversation we've been having all along about how to use that block grant funding and to target uh, your eligible uh, populations in terms of who you're serving. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like there are two questions um, that have been pulled and then we'll we'll open, I'm sorry, then we'll move on to the next category. So does the state expect each county to have a full in wrap, I'm sorry, a full in-house wraparound program? Does the state expect each county to have a full in-house wraparound program? So this is Cheryl Terrell again. Um, so I think that I want to make a distinction here that there seems to be some confusion between part four and part one. Um, we know that wraparound has been the required and identified model for aftercare for transitioning you from STRTP placements uh, into a family-based uh, program under Part 4. That is a separate and distinct requirement from FFPSA Part 1 Prevention Services. And right now we know wraparound is listed as a promising practice in the clearinghouse. Uh, but it's not an available intervention at this point under part one for, um, for, for the purposes of FFPSA. Um, our department has issued an ACL uh, uh, to describe that in more detail. It, it's ACL 21-116 uh, that describes what our approach is for wraparound. So 
we in the sense of if you're if you're asking for a full house requirement wraparounds have always been optional but when it comes to aftercare services with respect to part four it is required as a, as a choice so i hope that's helpful for context great thank you and thank you for i see links that were dropped in the chat um, that's information about wraparound as it relates to ffpsa part one uh, there's also an email, the wraparound questions. So thank you for that. It's in the chat. Last question is, does the state want counties to use one particular, pro one particular program or are we supposed to be picking from a list from the feds? So does the state want counties to use one particular program, for example, wraparound, or are we supposed to be picking from the list from the feds? So I'll jump in again. Um, so, you know, programs, you are you are so to select your programs after you do a needs assessment in your county in, in order to identify what from the list of the EVPs that we've identified in our state plan that you, you want to let you want to use. And of course, that that ties to my previous conversation about once you identify who your target population is, where is a good fit for those services and what 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 makes sense in your co county to use. So we're not dictating what to use other than the fact that if you want to initially start out with drawing down for uh, um, the 4E uh, funding to use the, the 10 identifier that we have, have in the state plan. Um, Errol, this is Kelly. I, the one thing I would add to that is that one thing that is required in your state plan is that you use the Title IV eligible services. You don't have to use all 10, but to the sense that it makes sense or to the extent that it makes sense for your county, um, those are the most sustainable of all of the funding sources we have, right? So ongoing Title IV match for all of those services. And so the more that you can set those up, the more sustainable of a program that you have. Thank you. Um, and I know, Cheryl, you had spoken about target population. There was a quick question in the chat I think we can address. Are counties able to adopt a scale-up approach with regard to talk target populations to serve? A scaled, did you say a scaled approach? Are counties able to adopt a scale-up approach with okay. regard to target populations to serve? Uh, I would say yes, and I would ask others of the team to chime in on that. I, I mean, you, you you can scale up. Uh, you if you mean if you mean ramping up slowly um, on your populations, um, I would I would expect that that would be a, a a useful plan because you have to do you have to do some capacity building first. So you know, depending on what your capacity is. You know, your economy of scale to implement a certain service would be your assessment that you would have to make to determine that. Great, thank you. And Martin or Martin, if um, I would ask you if you would like some further exploration, hang out with us until the end and then we'll do an open forum Q&A as well. All right, uh, thank you. So those were the most frequently asked program design questions. So now we're gonna move into policy questions here. Uh, some are shorter than others. And there was one that was dropped in here as well about the letter of intent that we'll address too. So thank you for that question in the chat. My first question is, when is the opt-in letter due? So I'll take that. That's a very easy one. The, um, the letter of intent is due on April 30th. Of, uh, so that's very soon. So um, uh, please, if you're interested, um, let us know that we're going to get that letter coming in in the next couple of weeks. Um, looking forward to getting those. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is the opt-in cycle every three years? So, you know, one of the things that is sort of unknown at this point is how long um, the, the state's prevention plan will go on. So our plan is a five-year plan with the federal government, um, but the state block grant funding is only for three years. And that's why the um, the FFPS state program is a three-year program. While we don't know what will happen after that three years, we do know that there are other funding um, sources available to support prevention and there's the Title IV-E program. So we haven't quite decided what that, what that opt-in like ongoing process will look like, but there will be more to come, I'm sure. Great. Um, and this was actually asked in the chat. We were planning 
um, I, I identified this question, so it's right in alignment. If counties don't opt in right now, can they do so later? So they can. So the letter of intent was intended to help counties um, access the state block grant money early if they needed time to develop their prevention plans. However, you can still submit a comprehensive prevention plan by January 31st of next year in order to opt in. Thank you. This one may have already been addressed. Are there any stats on the number of counties that have already opted in? So actually, no, we haven't talked about this yet so far. So the deadline has not passed yet, but already we have at least 14 counties who have either submitted a letter or have kind of indicated that they plan to. Um, so given that we don't have the, um, or we haven't passed that deadline yet, we think that that's encouraging. That's great. Okay. Um, and who makes the final decision on whether to participate? Is it CWS? Who is that? Okay, I'll take that question. So I want to emphasize the importance of collaboration and engagement. And if a county wants to create a robust comprehensive plan, the statute requires cross-sector collaboration. You, you must have that ability to, to collaborate in order to have the most comprehensive plan as possible. And you want to be able to provide input, solicit input, and people need to be aware of what that planning process is. And we realize that that may come at varying degrees at the local level. But if child welfare wants to opt in and probation doesn't, they still have to be involved. And you have to keep in mind that child welfare is the keeper of the funds. And that process, you know, they basically have the process of passing through the, the funding source. So um, basically uh, for those that are not at the table, we're, we're encouraging organizations to at least find out where that where that planning process is happening. And then at a minimum, the state, when we identify who the counties are that are opting in, we will be listing who those counties are and we will at least provide the points of contact so that you can make that connection. We're, we're just really encouraging counties to engage with their stakeholders and their community-based organizations in the planning process. So we, we are hoping in terms of the final decision that that decision is done collaboratively, collaboratively and together. Thank you. And uh, in the next topic, you know, I know we've talked about planning teams and things of that nature. We'll dive into that in a few questions, by the way, for the audience. Okay, um, will there be any interfaces to allow capture of data from probation departments without duplicate data entry. I can jump in on that one too. Um, basically our prevention services, and I think we alluded it to, to this earlier, is that everything is going to be automated in the care system. So in terms of data entry, everyone's going to be required to work in that system for, for data entry. Okay, thank you. And the last question I have for you under program design. If CPPs are not completed by January 31st of 23, can CDSS provide an extension, perhaps through submission of a milestones report? So I'll, I'll answer that one. Um, you know, as with any program we have here at CDSS, I mean, we always want to be flexible with counties and work on a case by cases to meet them where they're at. Now, having said that, I do still want to stress that this is a, the block grant is eligible for three years, right? We only have three years to expend this pro program funding. So the longer it takes for folks to opt in, um, the less time we have to spend that. And given that we have about $200 million, we want to make sure that we're setting counties up for success to be able to use the funds as well as possible. Thank you. All right. So those are um, the questions that were asked during registration or during the webinar, the frequently asked questions about program design. So I'm going to pop into tools and resources, and then we'll open it up for a general Q&A here. My first question here, what TA is available for the comprehensive prevention planning process and how do we sign up? Ms. Hillary, I can answer that one. Uh, we have been busy behind the scenes coming up with a TA roadmap, which is what you saw at the beginning. 
And then now using that TA roadmap, we're coming up with what the technical assistance is going to look like. Um, so we are developing a toolkit in partnership with Strategies TA, who is on this call. And that toolkit is going to align with the ACL block grant letter that listed the plan components and explain what each one of the plan components are with the definition, and then what our best practices in order to develop that actual plan component. So you can get to your end goal, which is the comprehensive prevention plan being finished and then implementing it. Um, in addition to that toolkit, Cheryl also mentioned a data playbook which is talking about how to use cross-sector data in order to make decisions about your prevention planning efforts. Um, it makes sure that you're addressing equity, uh, disaggregating data, as well as figuring out how to use the data to engage with your community in order to make decisions with their input and voice as well. Um, that data playbook is to be released uh, April 25th, I believe is the, the release date for that. So that will be coming out very soon. And uh, we worked with uh, Safe and Sound in order to develop that playbook and based on what we learned from the current cross-sector prevention planning efforts. Uh, we did some stakeholder groups in order to understand what were the areas that they needed assistance and support. Um, in addition to that, uh, we're coming up with an internal training plan for our CDSS staff so that they will be able to work with counties, specifically using the capacity and readiness assessments mm -hmm. and using those assessments as a way to help them determine which areas need to be addressed and connecting them to external or internal resources that can help them with those, uh, those areas. That's great. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. So can I add to that? Just that the toolkit Please. that we're developing includes a lot of the resources that are being uh, requested here. So we'll be linking back to those things. Awesome, thank you. And then I would say, Jess, in the meantime, while folks are waiting for these items to come out, they can definitely email the Prevention Services mailbox, and we can start talking to them and working with them now, as well as the capacity assessment. That link was in um, the block grant ACL letter, the Family First Prevention Services opt-in ACL. Um, so if they want to start working on that link, as soon as we see that folks have entered information into that capacity assessment, we will reach out to them. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and I've dropped, and we're, we've talked about this inbox, and we're going to continue to talk about the inbox. I have dropped a link to where you can find that, and I'll show you where exactly in just a few um, so thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, who do we turn that capacity building assessment into? Um, so I mentioned already, but basically it's a link and it's online and we will see the results once you go in and enter your information in there. And sorry, and that link is located where for anyone that didn't catch it? That's in the Family First Prevention Services opt-in uh, ACL, which is the block grant ACL as well. Okay, let me just, I actually have a link for that. I want to make sure it's the correct one. Yeah, that's correct. Wonderful. Okay, and what tools are available to assist with asset mapping? And I will go ahead and pass that to Lola because I'm sure she's eager to share. <laughs> and Sarah, feel free to hop in. Um, so that will be part of the toolkit that it will be made available as soon as humanly possible. Um, we're hoping, you know, early June maybe, but it has to go through a process. So um, th there are also on our website, which Lydia, if you don't mind popping in the chat, our um, prevention plan elements section for counties that has different resources for all of these, well, for many of these plan components, I would say. And uh, by the beginning of next fiscal year, it will have resources for most of them. All of them, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And there's that link. Thank you so much. Okay. What tools are available? We, this might be duplicative. Um, what tools are available for the readiness assessment? Is there a link? There will be, but right now we are developing the readiness assessment. Um, we've engaged some of our counties for their feedback uh, before finalizing it, but as soon as we have it, we'll release the link. Thank you. 
Um, and then I believe this was asked as well in the chat, when will the comprehensive prevention plan be available? And do we need to use that template? So as part of the toolkit, one of the pieces is the actual template for the comprehensive plan. Um, so as uh, Lola had mentioned, we're shooting for June, um, but we'll see. But no, you are not required to use that template. It's just a way to help guide you as you're developing your plan. Great, thank you so much. All right, um, I only have a few more. Are there any lessons learned, if you will, from other counties you can share about in the area of tools and resources, maybe resources, challenges, et cetera, anything that wasn't already mentioned earlier? And I'm gonna toss that over to Strategies TA as well. I, I will oh. say, oh, sorry. <laughs> I will say that we had a few teams that did asset mapping, but didn't engage some of their uh, community partners who were also doing a very similar mapping process. So then found out later when they both came to the table for some of the planning that it, they had done some duplicate asset mapping. So um, my suggestion is just for that, you know, you really engage your community stakeholders and um, really just check in with uh, all your partners to see how you can all sort of be part of that lift. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, and I will add, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, well, Lola, from yours, I'll, I'll just emphasize, uh, you had mentioned that Napa was working with a driver diagram and uh, that's a tool we use for development of a theory of change. And I think more than a lot of things, that's a tool that's put light bulbs over people's heads about, oh, this is this really directs things and directs our energies towards a goal that we need. We're really looking at the conditions that will bring about the change that we want. So we can share that as well. Yes, and developing a, a mission and vision for your collaborative advisory group um, is also key, making sure that they have shared vision and shared language. So they're all speaking the same language, whether they're you know community-based organizations or child welfare. Thank you. All right, and how do I find out if my county has a prevention planning team and how do I get in? So I'm gonna go ahead and email the list of the current cross-sector prevention planning teams after this call. Um, but if you also wanna find out if your county in particular is working on comprehensive prevention planning related to 4E funds and the state block grant, um, you can email the prevention services general mailbox and I think what we're going to do is identify a contact for each county that has opted in and post that on our FFPSA website as well. Thank you very much. All right, and this is the last um, question that I've prepared before we dive into some of the chat questions. I haven't heard anything from CWS about this effort. Who do I reach out to to get involved? Will there be a check to ensure that community members are actively involved in the process? So I can go ahead and speak to that yeah. one. Um, so um, I think Hillary just talked about how you can um, identify if a county, you know, who, the, who to call in the county um, to get connected with their prevention planning team. Um, and having said that, you know, we really want counties to be looking at this program as a CQI opportunity. Um, so to the extent that they can be um, ongoing and engaging their community partners in an ongoing way to make sure that it's meeting the needs of the community, we would really want to encourage that. So, um, you know, really just um, encourage you to reach out and try to connect with your county partners. We will help you do that. Um, and, um, you know, the vision really in includes that, you know, ongoing active community involvement. So certainly our intention. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I have one more question in the chat before I show everyone that inbox that we keep talking about. I wanna mention that before we open up for Q&A. Is there an interagency leadership team, a requirement, oh, sorry, is an interagency, agency leadership team a requirement of FFPSA or the CPP? Um, so I can take that one as well, Jessica. Um, so in the state block grant letter, we did actually um, include the interagency leadership team as an example of how you might 
pull together a planning team, but it is not a requirement. Um, recognizing that many of the same partners that you would already need to engage that are included in the statute are involved in that team. Um, it may be a good environment, but depending on your local um, goings on, it may not be. So um, just an example of how you might do it. We've heard a number of other ways in which counties are thinking about how they might wanna do that. Um, you know, especially those prevention planning teams that are already together in those 24 counties um, may be a great start. Um, so, you know, it could look different and we really want to be flexible and make sure that that um, meets the needs at the local level. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to open it up for Q&A here, but before we do, I wanted to show you, as we're talking through, you may have a very specific question about your county, your agency, uh, that may not be directly addressed because it's so specific to you. That's why it's so important for you to know where to find this inbox we keep talking about. Where where do questions go when you don't know who to ask? I'm going to share my screen with you and then I'll drop a link. So in the chat, what you're going to see here in a moment, if you click that link, you're going to be looking at what we're looking at on the screen. This is the main site here. It's the info and resources for FFPSA. And on the screen highlighted in yellow now is that contact information. That's that inbox that you would send questions to. A lot of these questions that you had today would be perfect questions in the inbox if a Q&A is not available. Not just so that you can get an answer. And I'm actually curious, does anyone know uh, when questions are submitted to this inbox, what happens next? Is it a timeline to expect a response? Any thoughts on that? Yes, again, this is Kelly. Um, so what we're gonna be doing is um, uh, answering questions immediately as they're asked. But in addition to that, we're gonna batch questions together and send out and post on this website our kind of FAQs that will happen every other month. Um, so you can get a question right away um, within reason um, and then also see them posted on the website as we know that there are ongoing questions that many people would be interested in the answer to. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure you knew where to find that outside of this webinar. So thank you. All right. So now, uh, you know, we've had a chance to address those frequently asked questions. We've had a chance to address some of the questions in the chat. I'd love to open it up now to the audience, to those of you participants that are with us. What questions do you have? This is a great opportunity to ask those questions. You can either raise your hand in the chat. I'm sorry, raise your hand um, from the participant bar or in your toolbar, and I'll call on you and I'll bring you off of mute to ask your question to the panel, or you can also submit it in the question in the chat below. So I'll give you a moment while you type out or raise your hand. This is exciting. This is telling me that a lot of your questions are answered. I'll give you an extra second for the slow typers in the house like me. No? Well then, I, let's see here. I'm checking now. I don't see one. All right. So here is, um, the thing. Oh, let's see. Um, something that I want to mention, a couple things. Um, you know, we have several partners on the call. So if you're not too sure, what questions should I ask or who could answer these questions for me? Just to remind you that CDSS is here, Strategies TA, that technical assistance piece is here. We have DHCS here. Um, Caltrin, we are, I'm happy to answer a question if you have one. Um, so please feel free to ask those questions. If not, I still have more content for you. I guess then I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm a trainer by trade. Um, of the topics that we have discussed, which one so far has been the most helpful? I'm gonna ask you to put that in the chat. Was it funding, policy? Could it be program design? I'm gonna ask you to put that in the chat. So far, what has been the most helpful that you were like, you know what, I'm so happy we're talking about this. I'll ask you to drop that in the chat. What's been the most helpful? Panelists, you can respond to that as well.
funding and program design. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, those were actually some of the most frequently asked questions. So it's, I'm happy to hear that. Funding. Thanks, Jess. Funding. Great. I'm happy we started with it. Funding and program. Wonderful. All right. For the state black grant opt-in, there's a question from Cynthia. There was a question asking if you would like a meeting set up with D uh, CDSS. We said yes, but haven't heard anything back. This is Humboldt County. Hi, Humboldt. Is there a projected timeline when these county specific conversations might happen? I can take that one. And Cynthia, I think you're, you haven't heard back, maybe my fault. So my apologies there. Um, so uh, if you could resubmit any requests um, and Cynthia, I'll follow up with you personally. Um, we have not got all of our TA together just yet. So we're still working on pulling together all of those fun pieces that you heard Lola um, mostly speak about and, and uh, Hillary as well. Um, and we'll be planning things beginning. We still have the staff to train and lots of um, moving parts here at CDSS, but we don't want that to stop the conversation. Um, it just could be, um, you know, that we're busy and I, I think I missed it. And so sorry for that. Um, but yes, absolutely. We'll be doing that sort of information. We're anticipating the launch of the TA program sometime in the summer with some elements becoming available prior to that. You heard Lola talk a little bit about June. Um, uh, Hillary has some stuff coming out in April. We want it to be available to you as soon as we have it, but the full program piece is really more slated for summertime. Thank you. And thank you for your question, Cynthia. <laughs> All right. So I don't see any other questions in here. So what I'd like to do is just give you some expectations of next steps. And if additional questions come through, that is totally fine. Let me reshare my screen. So now what? <laughs> What's the next step? Send your questions. Those questions that might come up, especially as you are thinking through what you've learned today and, and uh, maybe talking through it with your team, send them to that uh, FFPSA Prevention Services inbox. That was the previous screen, I'll remind you. Let me show you very quickly. We were here. So that's where you will submit questions and you're highly encouraged to do so. Having the questions submitted there also gives the team an idea of what questions are most needed so that the frequently asked question document can be the most helpful. Um, thank you, Martin, I see you, Mar or Martin, I will ask that question in a second. Um, some other next steps is to attend the Roadmap to Comprehensive Prevention Planning Clinic. It's coming up on the 19th. So if this is step two of the comprehensive planning conversation, step three is that clinic that's happening on the 19th. And uh, are, is any of the, are any of the facilitators to that clinic on the line? Who's facilitating? Troy will be facilitating that. And I think unfortunately he had a conflict today. I agree. Um, well, the clinic is a little different than the Q&A. Any thoughts on what the difference is? So if you attended today, why would you attend on the 19th? Lola, um, I see you unmuted yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think that we'll be um, discussing uh, the technical assistance offerings that are available and, and the broader context of the full continuum of, of system of care and services rather than just FFPS specific. Thank you. And there's a registration link in the chat. Thank you, Dana. Um, wonderful. Next, you'll want to continue attending the Reimagining Prevention series. There's a, many components to this conversation. And I'm going to show you next a slide of what is upcoming and where you can find that information. I believe you can find all that information in the link that Dana just dropped. And also, don't forget, your letter of intent is due April 30th. And Hillary, would you remind them one more time, if they want to get information on where to submit that letter, where would they go? They would email the FFPSA Prevention Services mailbox. All right. Um, perfect. Now, I want to give you a quick recap of what the webinars are that are coming up. Um, for example, we have some well-supported EBPs. I've dropped that in the, the link as well. Leading Through Change, um, it's kind of a change management series. I am facilitating those myself. Uh, and then we have, of course, the follow-up clinic on the 19th and so much more. 
The last thing I want to do is, let's see, I want to make sure I address this question in the chat. It looks like it might be two parts here. Um, from Martin or Martin, methodologies on how to extract and analyze data around projected target populations is needed. Based on the populations addressed in draft state plan, how can counties project the numbers locally that might fall into these categories? So I think you heard Hillary, hi, this is Lola from Strategies TA. I think you heard Hillary mention before about the data playbook, and that does describe a great deal of context for how to use data and how to collect data and what are reputable sources for data. And additionally, you can use your county self-assessment and, and system improvement plan data as well. And if you're like, these things sound great, I would love to talk to someone about it. You're going to send it to the inbox. That's right, and get a phone call back. Um, wonderful. And then there was Rosario said to add to the question, would we be able to use SIP data that was used to identify gaps in targeted populations? Yes, you can definitely leverage um, data collection efforts that you have made before in order to help you identify uh, which populations you're going to serve and which candidacy groups. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to move to the final slide. However, if you're, these questions are coming up for you, please don't be shy to put them in the chat. I also will check for any raised hands, which I have not seen. Um, okay. Can I add one more thing on this uh, page? Please. We're currently in the planning of a statewide uh, meeting for prevention planning related to this. And so um, one of the ideas that has been floated thus far is that the first day would be like a pre-institute for those who have not engaged in prevention planning before and um, their consultants. So keep, stay tuned. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. I think we can say that's June 1st, 2nd and 3rd. Perfect. So June 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Wonderful. All right. And so the last slide here, um, what's next? Just want to remind you that the materials, there were a lot of links that were dropped, a lot of great questions. That information will be summarized and sent in a follow-up email. We highly encourage you to register for that next event. Don't forget that your um, letter of intent would be due the 30th. And of course, if you have questions, that inbox is going to be a great place to submit. And with that, I want to thank participants for joining today, asking these great questions, um, and thank you to the panelists for providing some clarity today. 